Father Claude, we're happy to have you. Welcome. Father Claude Franklin is originally from Fayetteville, North Carolina. He was ordained in 1997. At present, he is the pastor of St. Joseph's Maronite Church in Oleon, New York. We're happy to have you, Father. And just to share a few of his um, articles and publications, Father Claude has written a master's thesis paper titled The Use of Symbols and Typology by the Syriac Fathers in Teaching Salvation History. He also has a licentiate thesis paper entitled Oil of Gladness, the Historical Origins of the Maronite Rite of Lamb. And Father, at present, he contributes quite regularly to the Maronite Voice, writing on different articles of the saints and our liturgical spirituality. And it's really a blessing to have you, Father, and to really gain from your experience. So thank you for all the preparation, and we look forward to learning from you tonight. Thank you, sisters, and uh, good evening to everyone. And uh, well, let's begin about the healing mysteries. Uh, and that's usually what these two of the mysteries, um, which in the West they call the sacraments, are penance and the anointing of the sick. And uh, so before I um, get into the talk proper, let me just kind of um, give almost like a little summary <laughs> um, of what we're going to kind of look at um, in general for the entire Catholic church and also include the, with the Orthodox church, the mysteries of penance and the anointing of the sick. Um, while we would say they always existed uh, as part of uh, in the numbering of the mysteries, um, their development, at least in ritual form, was a much later development than some of the other <clears throat> rituals for um, for these mysteries. Um, and because of that, uh, for the Maronites in, in particular, um, uh, since we're speaking on our subject, these two mysteries didn't uh, develop in the same way. And in some ways, basically what we do now, we borrowed from the Latin tradition and uh especially with regard to penance we'll, we'll see that um but even with the anointing of the sick um there is quite a bit of uh, latin influence into our um uh, into our, our rituals but let's go through and, and see how that um historically um took place so uh if you can move forward sister Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, is penance, with the prayer of forgiveness, which is sluto de shukono. Okay, next, please. Okay, so obviously the the first place when we look at uh, the various mysteries, um, we have to look to the scriptures, and for penance. Uh, there are numerous uh, places where it talks about forgiveness of sins, but the ones that are most prominent are, of course, um, Matthew 16, 19, and then Matthew 18, 18. And this is with the, uh, in 16 is when Peter is told, you know, what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then in Matthew 18, the same power of binding and loosing is given to all of the apostles. And therefore, it's also passed down through apostolic succession to the bishops and, their, and then to priests. But uh, then you also have John 20, 22 to 23. Jesus breathes upon the apostles saying, receive the Holy oh, Spirit. Yeah. If you forgive if you anyone's forgive. sins, their sins are That's forgiven. If you do not forgive them. Sister, I think you muted me. Oh. 
Okay. Can everybody hear me now? I don't know where I left off here. Uh, so we have John. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Again, connecting with the binding and loosing. And then you have James 5, um, the epistle of James. Let him call for the elders, pre the presbyters, which is the Greek word presbyteros, of the church. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So these are the uh, the primary ones. And this last one from James will also be um, utilized for the anointing of the sick, as we'll see. So um, next slide, please, sister. So then uh, we look at the catechism of the Catholic Church. We want to see about what, what are the effects? What... What does this mystery uh, do? And uh, we're told in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the whole power of the sacrament of penance consists in restoring us to God's grace and joining us with him in an intimate friendship. Reconciliation with God is thus the purpose and effect of this sacrament. This sacrament reconciles us with the church, Sin damages or even breaks fraternal communion. The sacrament of penance repairs or restores it. In this sense, it does not simply heal the one restored. In this sense, it does not simply heal the one restored to ecclesial communion, but has also a revitalizing effect on the life of the church which suffered from the sin of one of her members. Okay, so... Uh, note here that the the mystery of penance not only has the effect of reconciling us with God, but also with the other members of the church that have been it's that have suffered from the sin of others. That's even when we think, oh, this doesn't affect anybody else. Sin always affects everyone in some way, and so we have to be restored uh, communally. Next, please. So, how did the early church practice penance? Again, the Catechism of the Catholic Church gives a nice little uh, summary of uh, what took place. It says, during the first centuries, the reconciliation of Christians who had committed particularly grave sins after their baptism, for example, idolatry, murder, or adultery, was tied to a very rigorous discipline, according to which penitents had to do public penance for their sins, often for years, before receiving reconciliation. To this order of penitents, which con concerned only certain grave sins, so again, idolatry, murder, adultery, those type things, was only rarely admitted, and in certain regions, only once in a lifetime. Okay, and we're going to see uh, some of this rigorous discipline described in, in, in a bit here. Um, but that was the way, in the past, it was, it was a, a, a public form of penance. It wasn't the way we think of, uh, of penance now. Next, please. So let's look at some quotations from some of the uh, early church documents and uh, some of the early church fathers. So the Didache, this is a, a writing, the word Didache means teaching, um, and sometimes it's called the teaching of the apostles, which was written around 96 AD, says this in chapter 14, confess your sins in church. And do not go to Eucharistic prayer with an evil conscience. This is the way of life. So notice already the need for the church. Polycarp, in his epistle to Philippi, be compassionate and merciful toward those that strayed, knowing that we are all under the debt of sin and need forgiveness. Notice 
He's encouraging compassion for others, not to be judgmental toward others, because we all might need that compassion and not judgmentalness. Cyprian, let everyone confess his sins while he is still in this world, while his confession can still be heard, while the forgiveness of his sins granted to him by a priest is still acceptable to God. So notice, first, it's time sensitive while he's still in the world. And then also the, the, uh, that the priest absolves on behalf of God. Next, please. St. Ambrose says, We are commanded by our Lord to confer the grace of the heavenly sacrament to those guilty, even of the greatest sins, if they, with a sincere confession, bear the penance due to their sins. Okay, so notice a couple things here. First, you need to have true contrition, right? You got to be truly sorry, but also you have to fulfill your penance. And then basically the uh, forgiveness is given by God through the priest. St. John Chrysostom, what priests do on earth, God ratifies in heaven. The master confirms the decision of his servants, the priests. Indeed, he has given them nothing less than the full authority of heaven. So this again goes with that whole, the binding and loosing, right? The authority to bind and loose. Next, please. Okay, so remember in the catechism, it talks about the rigorous uh, form of uh, that penance took. Well, St. Basil the Great is the one who is famous for having kind of set the standard for the, the time period for, for things like this. So here's a, uh, an, an example from one of his letters. He says, and after he has come to to a sense of that fearful sin, let him weep for three years, standing at the door of the house of prayer, so the church, and entreating the people as they go in to, to prayer that each and all will mercifully offer on his behalf their prayers with earnestness to the Lord. So notice the sinner is standing outside the church for three years. They're not allowed to even enter into the church, and they are begging people to pray for them, and the people are encouraged to pray for the, for the sinners. After this, so after the three years, let him be received for another period of three years to hearing alone, and while hearing the scriptures and the instruction, let him be expelled and not be admitted to prayer. So for three years, he gets to stand at the back of the church, just listening to when the, the scriptures are being proclaimed and the homily, and then they are kicked out with like the catechumens. Afterwards, if he has asked it with tears and has fallen before the Lord with contrition of heart and great humiliation, let kneeling be accorded to him during another three years. So now he gets to stay, but he has to, to kneel down during the entire liturgy for three years. Notice this is why the, in the Eastern churches we do not kneel for the Eucharistic liturgy, because that what meant you were part of the order of penitence. That's why we stand as a sign of the resurrection. Kneeling is penitential. And during the liturgy, especially on Sundays, it's not a it's not a penitential thing. Even during the great fast, it's not a penitential uh, thing because it's Sunday is always a reminder of the resurrection. Thus, when he shall have worthily shown the fruits of repentance, let him be received in the tenth year to the prayer of the faithful without oblation. So now he gets to go to the anaphora but without the oblation. Okay, so it means he can't participate in the com communion. So remember, all this time he's been excommunicated. Right? And after standing with the faithful in prayer for two years, 
then, and not till then, let him be held worthy of the communion of the good things. So finally he gets re-admitted to communion. And then that would be a, such a joyous day for the community. Remember what the scriptures say, right? The angels rejoice in heaven over one repentant sinner than over all the righteous ones, right? So this is the, the thinking here. So, okay, next slide, please. Now, around the same time, in contrast, we have in the Egyptian deserts, the desert fathers. And listen to the how how much this contrasts to, to what we just heard. This is from one of the sayings of the fathers, Abba uh, Pomen. Or this is what on our calendar some you might see, Biamin. Biamin is Pomen. A brother questioned Abba Pullman, saying, I have committed a great sin, and I want to do penance for three years. The old man said to him, That is a lot. The brother said, For one year? The old man said again, That is a lot. Those who were present said, For forty days. He said again, That is a lot. He added, I myself say that if a man repents with his whole heart and does not intend to commit the sin anymore, God will accept him after only three days. So notice here, we got compassion going on from the, the spiritual father and also temperance. You know, sometimes you might have to look at the the person and 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 priest will tell you when, when somebody comes to confession, you have to make a judgment if the person is um, really taking this serious. Are they just there because, you know, um, somebody said, oh, you need to go to confession? Are they kind of just going through the motions? We have to guide the person. That's part of our job. And in this case, we saw with, with Abba Pullman doing that. Next slide, please. So with both of these forms of penance in the early church, we already see the main elements that are, are present with regard to the mystery of penance. There's the confession of the sin, right? It's even with all the different quotes from the fathers, either publicly they're professing it or privately, and maybe in the case of like the desert fathers. The repentance of sins through an expression of sorrow, so some kind of contrition. The confession of sins in the presence of the bishop or a priest or a spiritual father, though not specifically an ordained priest in the case of the desert fathers. Sometimes it was confessing to a fellow brother who may not have been a, a, a priest. Some form of penance, okay? So fasting, the years of kneeling outside the church, excommunication, whatever you have, whatever's been assigned to you. And then some form of absolution, usually by being readmitted to the community, whether the church community or the monastic community, after the, the penance that has been prescribed has been completed, okay? So you, you do your, your penance, and then you're welcomed back into the, the community. Next, please. So again, from the catechism, they give a nice summary of kind of how things moved from the early church to more of what we're used to now. It says, during the 7th century, Irish missionaries, notice, inspired by the Eastern monastic tradition, so the Desert Fathers, took to continental Europe the private practice of penance, which does not require public and prolonged completion of penitential works before reconciliation with the church. From that time on, the sacrament has been performed in secret between penitent and priest. This new practice envisioned the possibility of repetition and so opened the way to regular frequently frequenting of this sacrament. It allowed the forgiveness of grave sins and venial sins to be integrated into one sacramental celebration. In its main lines, this is the form of penance that the church has practiced down to our day. 
Okay, so there's a lot in there. So what, what they're saying here is from that time forward, penance became more private, not that big public type thing. Um, you have both the grave sins, which were the only ones that were being done, uh, forgiven publicly, what we would call venial sins or faults or whatever, those were taken care of by other means anyways uh, prior. To, you didn't have to go to uh, to confession. Um, it was only those various serious sins like murder, apostasy, adultery, etc. But also the idea that now it could be repeated because as the catechism noted earlier, often you if you you were allowed that time period of that like 10 years to go through that that was your one last shot after baptism now they were seeing that you could could constantly repeat this so we should be really grateful that we are given these opportunities to confess again and again and again and we really should take up the church up on this great opportunity that has granted us next slide please Okay, so the Maronite rite of penance. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we really never developed our own individual private rite of penance. And uh, in the U.S., the current approved translation of the rite of penance is actually borrowed from the 1942 Maronite ritual book. And in that 1942 ritual book, the rite of penance is merely a modified version in Syriac with the corresponding prayers in Karshuni. Karshuni is Arabic, but written in Syriac letters, of the Latin text that's found in the Trinitine ritual books, including the prayer of absolution. So right now, the Maronite Church in the U.S. actually celebrates the old Latin Trinitine form of, of penance that the the Latin church doesn't really even celebrate anymore unless you go to a traditional Latin mass uh, church. Next, please. However, the Maronite church, like the other Syriac churches, did develop a special penance service, which is celebrated on the Saturday of the light. And I don't know if any of the, the people here tonight Maybe we can, in the question and answer period, they could uh, could answer this for me, but have attended the uh, the Saturday of the Light penance service. But it's a nice little uh, service, and it's simply entitled Prayer of Forgiveness, Sluto de Shukono. And it actually has many similarities to the fourth century practice of public penance and readmission to the community. But unfortunately, the manuscripts do not indicate whether this ritual was actually celebrated with faithful publicly confessing their sins or as a rich ritual of preparation for private confession or even as some form of general absolution. Today, we use it as a sort of preparatory ritual and then after we hear individual uh, confessions. But uh, it's a guess as to how it was practiced uh, in, in prior. Next, please. Now, in this prayer of forgiveness service, there is uh, one of the prayers. So some of you may know this terminology. The, you know the prayer when the priest or the uh, is incensing uh, the, the long prayers before the, um, the readings. That's called the Hasoyo. The whole the whole prayer is called Hasoyo, which means pardon. And the longest of those prayers, the one right before the hymn, is called the Cedro, which actually means order, because because it's usually listing of you did this, you did this, you did this type thing. And now we ask for this, 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 and this. It's like a list of petitions. That Cedro from this prayer of forgiveness on Saturday of the Light. Uh, is almost identical in wording to the rite of pardon in the East Syriac tradition. So this will be the Chaldeans or the Assyrian Church of the East. And the word 
Hosoyo, as I said, means pardon or forgiveness. And so I feel like it would be very appropriate if we were to consider reforming our private confession uh, ritual to use this cedro as the prayer of absolution, since it's the prayer of absolution and the rite of pardon from the East Syriac tradition, and we share that in common with them, rather than using the Latin Trinitine prayer of absolution that, as we currently do. Next slide, please. So let's look at this, this cedro. It says, glory to you, O Holy One. You descended from the heavenly dwellings to the earthly depths. So the incarnation. Right? In your compassion, you took the form of a slave to forgive your servants. You walked on the waves of the sea in order to sanctify Adam, who was created in the image of your majesty. Okay, so he's fixing uh, Adam, right? Adam was created in the image of the majesty. Now he's sanctifying him. He's purifying him. And notice even this idea of the, the, the sea, right? Uh, which should evoke also about St. Peter being pulled up when he was uh, drowning when he didn't believe. So we kind of have that image going on. Oh, Lord, you sanctified those who are impure, and with your hyssop, you purified sinners and made them whiter than snow. Of course, that should what? Evoke Psalm 50 or 51, right? Sprinkle me with hyssop that I may be purified. Wash me that I may be whiter than snow. Through your powerful grace, forgive me. So the priest is asking for forgiveness also during this service. And your servants who ask you, for the pardon of their faults and the forgiveness of their sins. As you forgave the family of Cornelius through the hand of Simon Peter, okay, so remember in Acts of the Apostles, Peter went to this uh, family of Cornelius and he baptized them and forgave them and all that, right? So as you did it through the hand of Simon Peter, the apostle, in the same way, may pardon of sins descend upon us and upon all the children of your flock who have been redeemed by your precious blood. We glorify you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Okay. Next, please. Okay. So that's penance in a nutshell. <laughs> so now let's look at the mystery of the anointing of the sick. And we're going to tie this in with, we'll see, with the rite of the lamp or the taxo da candilo. Next, please. Okay, so again, the first place to, to look for, um, for about this mystery is the scriptures. And there's really only two scripture verses with regard to the anointing of the sick. You could sort of add a, th a third one. Let me do these and I'll mention the third possibility. But these are the two most explicit. Mark 6, 13. They cast out demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. And then James 5, 14 to 15. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders, the presbyters of the church, and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. The third possibility is... Um, it's in Luke's gospel, and that's the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, where it talks about that he poured oil and wine on the wounds. But that's, I mean, it, it, it does show like that oil was used for healing purposes, but it doesn't really 
say anything about like prayers being evoked or uh, but then again neither does mark it just says they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them it, so um next slide please okay so what's the effect of the anointing of the sick you know kind of why do why do we do this the catechism of the catholic church states the first grace of this sacrament is one of strengthening peace and courage to overcome the difficulties that God, that, that excuse me, that go with the condition of serious illness or the frailty of old age. This grace is a gift of the Holy Spirit who renews trust and faith in God and strengthens against the temptations of the evil one, the temptation to, to discouragement and anguish in the face of death. This assistance from the Lord by the power of his spirit is meant to lead the sick person to healing of the soul, but also of the body, if such is God's will. Furthermore, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Okay, so notice uh, it's to strengthen us uh, for those in, in, in sickness, to also strengthen us against temptations. And for the person's soul, but also we often are obviously praying for the, the healing of their body, too. But it's all about what, what God wills. And then notice the, fa the last line where it talks about, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And I'll try and come back to that in, in, in a bit here, if I remember. <laughs> Next, please. Okay, so also from the Catechism, we hear about the practice in the early church. It says, from ancient times in the liturgical traditions of both East and West, we have testimonies to the practice of anointings of the sick with blessed oil. Over the centuries, the anointing of the sick was conferred more and more exclusively on those at the point of death. Because of this, it received the name extreme unction, or the last anointing. This is where the whole idea of last rites came from, okay? Notwithstanding this evolution, the liturgy has never failed to beg the Lord that the sick person may recover his health if it would be conducive to his salvation. So notice, the church has never stated that it should be the last anointing and only the last anointing. But that just became the practice um, over time. But uh, in our prayers, as we'll see some of the ones later, the Maronite prayers certainly evoke the idea of restoration of, of, of health for the person, not like their end time uh, anointing. Okay, next slide, please. So let's look at some, uh, uh, a couple of quotes from some early church um, fathers and uh, other documents. So in the, in the uh, early 5th century, Sulpicius Severus wrote about St. Martin, and he has this to say, a certain father of a family ventured to bring to Martin his daughter of 12 years old, who had been dumb from her birth begging that the blessed man would loose by his pious merits her tongue, which was thus tied. The father begged Martin to accomplish what was hoped for. He made no further delay, being admirable in both respects, in the display, first of all, of humility, and then in not putting off a pious duty, but orders the crowd of people standing round to be removed, and while the bishops only and the father of the girl were present, he prostrates himself in prayer after his usual fashion. He then blesses a little oil while he utters the formula of exorcism, and holding the tongue of the girl with his fingers, he thus pours the consecrated liquid into her mouth. Nor did the result of the power thus exerted disappoint the holy man. He asked her the name of her father, and she instantly replied, The father cries out, 
embracing the knees of Martin with a mixture of joy and tears. And while all around are amazed, he confesses that then, for the first time, he listened to the voice of his daughter. Now, there's a number of things in here. I forgot to mention at the beginning, St. Martin was a monk, but was not a priest. Okay, or a bishop. He was so he was not among the clergy. Notice it talks about his pious merits. Notice it mentions that the bishops were there, but they're not doing the blessing of the oil. They're not anointing. They're not doing anything. They're just standing there being witnesses. It is Martin who blesses the oil, uttering a formula of exorcism, which is basically a consecration. And then he takes that consecrated oil, puts it in her mouth. No, he just, notice he doesn't anoint her. And it is through this effort of his, but both through his piety and through uh, this act that this young girl is, is, uh, is cured. Next, please. Now, in, in the fourth century, we have this document called the Apostolic Constitutions, which has a lot of different uh, prayers and other things in it. Um, and this document was from the environs of Antioch, so it reflects from our tradition. And in it, um, we have this blessing of water and oil. And the first part of it is like an instruction. So we hear, Concerning the water and oil, I, Matthew, he was the bishop, command thus, let the bishop bless the water or the oil. However, if he is absent, let the presbyter bless them, the deacon assisting. But if the bishop is there, let the presbyter and the deacon assist. Let him say thus, O Lord of hosts, the God of powers, creator of the waters and provider of oil, you who are compassionate and a lover of mankind, the giver of water for drinking and for cleansing, and of oil that cheers man's countenance for joy and gladness, do you yourself now, through Christ, sanctify this water and this oil in the name of him or her that has brought them, and grant them power to restore health, to drive away diseases, to put demons to flight, to protect the household, and to put flight all snares of the enemy through Christ our hope, through whom, in the Holy Spirit, glory, honor, and worship be to you forever. Amen. So a couple things to point out here. So notice it's specifying here that only the bishop or the priest are to bless the oil or the water. And the presbyter only does it if the bishop is not... Uh, there, but the deacon is not given permission to do so. And then the prayer uh, evokes this idea of the water being for drinking and cleansing, to heal like sort of the inside and to wash, to make the first person pure. And then like after you would maybe wash with that oil, you could put the oil on to moist, sort of like a moisturizing, right? So, so it talks about the countenance. So you have a nice glow to you. Um, but notice it also talks about blessing the people that have brought them to the church. Okay, so this is sort of like in the same sense that um, the bread and the wine would have been brought to the church. Okay, in the Roman church, they still have this idea of the offertory of bringing up the, the gifts. I know some of Maronite churches have the people bringing up the gifts, but they should not be doing that because they've already been set aside for the purpose of the liturgy. People would have brought them before the liturgy, and once the gifts are prepared on, uh, at the, on the side or on the altar, the laity should not be touching them anymore. But in the Roman church, they don't, they're prepared at the altar after they're presented. They actually have an offertory. We don't have an offertory in our tradition. But at the same time, liturgy in, in in this tradition, they would have been bringing oil and water to be blessed. Notice it's for restoring of health, driving away diseases, even for like 
getting rid of like the, the water to sprinkle, like, like holy water, right? Demons to flight, to protect the household. So we get the impression that not only would they bring it, they would have taken this home as well so that they could uh, utilize it at home. And if we're not sure about that, let's go to the next slide and see what we're talking about, or what the early practice was. Sister, next slide, please. So, Pope St. Innocent I, who died in 417, wrote an epis epistle, so a letter to Decincium. And in it, they're discussing about the passage of uh, from St. James' letter, uh, the epistle, where it talks about, uh, you know, the anointing. He says, Let, there is no doubt that the passage ought to be received or understood of the sick faithful, for they have the right of being anointed with the holy oil of chrism, and I'll explain that in a minute, which being consecrated by the bishop, it is lawful not only for priests, but for all Christians to use for anointing in their own need or in the need of members of their household. So first of all, Chrism here does not mean the 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 principal chrism that with the, the smelly one, right? The, uh, in the in Latin, they they used to have different oils, and some of them were also inclu including the oil of the sick was called a chrism. The the chrism chrism was called cr chrism uh, like the principal chrism. So we're talking about oil of the sick here. Notice it talks about it being consecrated by the bishop. Doesn't specify when the oil is, is consecrated. But notice it says it's not only lawful for priests to anoint, but for all Christians to use this oil for an anointing for in their need or in the need of the members of their household. So you get the impression that they were also taking this oil home and using it to anoint people as, as needed. So uh, maybe we can kind of point out a few things here is that basically it's more important who who's blessing it at this point in the church than who's doing the actual anointing. There's there's also no um, no ritual given, no particular formula that's supposed to be said. It's just as if you take it home and you just anoint the person or maybe use the oil even in cooking okay so there's there's no specific indications of how this was uh utilized next slide please so the rituals develop later on and for the Eastern churches, it's around the 11th century that the Greek church developed a ritual for blessing the oil of the sick and the anointing of the sick, which became known as the eucaleon, or prayer oil. And the eucaleon had various stages in its development. However, it's not until the 15th century that it took on its current shape of a sevenfold service. So you would have gathered seven priests, you would have had seven epistles, seven gospels, seven lamps that are lit, even seven anointings. Uh, and in the earliest stages, it actually took place over seven days. So, And then they brought all the seven down to one day. Um, it's around this time, around the 15th century, that the Maronite Church and most of the other Eastern churches adopted this eucaleon as a prototype. So they took the skeleton structure, but they adapted it to each of their own liturgical patrimonies. In the Maronite Church, this ritual became known as the rite of the lamp. Next slide, please. So, is the rite of the lamp the anointing of the sick? Well, I'll give you my quick, simple answer to that. Yes, or yes with an asterisk. Yes, it was, it should be, 
and hopefully in the future it will once again be. That's my my uh, politically correct uh, response to that. But let's look at where, where the confusion comes in and why I have to even ask this question. Next slide, please. So the Synod of Mount Lebanon in 1736, no, Bishop Gregory was not at the Synod of Mount Lebanon in 1736. <laughs> Uh, but it talks in the prayer here about Holy Thursday with the chrism, so I figured I'd put a picture of him blessing the oils. Um, this synod of Mount Lebanon in 1736 was extremely Latinizing on our church. It imposed many Latin practices upon the Maronite church. And with regard to the anointing of the sick, we're going to see where um, some of its influence has affected our thinking about this mystery. So, one of the documents says, Since then, both in the Greek rite, as in our Syriac, the ancient usage prevails, meaning the rite of the lamp, that not only by a priest, in the same administration of the sacrament of extreme unction, might be blessed the oil of the sick, but also the same oil by the bishop once a year on Holy Thursday together with chrism is solemnly consecrated. We permit, therefore, that both rites be retained. Okay, so we got sort of a dual sacrament here or mystery. We got two different forms of how to consecrate this oil. And to the priest, we confirm the power to bless the same oil. So they're not denying that priests can do it. In that case in which oil blessed by the bishop, because of its frequent use, has come to be lacking. So, you know, like now we get these little bottles of, of oil, and maybe you have to anoint so many people, you, you're starting to run out. However, where there is oil consecrated by the bishop, we strictly enjoin simple priests, and they mean simple priests meaning just priest, not uh, priest being uh, in the general sense even for bishops, simple priest that they use it in the anointing of the sick and let them not dare consecrate new oil themselves. So if you have the bishop's oil, the oil, oil of the sick from the bishop, don't you dare consecrate your own oil of the sick. And further, we urge the same priests that when there is some oil blessed by the bishop, but not in that quantity which suffices for the sacramental functioning, then to them it is permitted a bit of non-consecrated oil to mix in. However, in only such manner that it be a quantity less than the, the consecrated oil. So here they're saying it's even better to mix unconsecrated oil in with the oil blessed by the bishop than for a priest to bless new oil. and But he got to have the right quantities and percentages of, of the mixing. Now, my personal opinion is this is ridiculous. Um, and uh, But it also conveys a very scholastic mentality. This is sort of that how many angels can, can uh, you know, stand on, on the head of a pen, right? That kind of a thing. So uh, we have this from the Synod of Mount Lebanon. Next slide, please. Also from the Synod of Mount Lebanon, we read, And although it is also the custom in the Eastern Church that one anoints with blessed oil, which they call the oil of the lamp, okay, so they're acknowledging the rite of the lamp, and even the healthy are anointed in penitence, we prescribe to be declared to all through the pastors and others who have the care of souls that, that that anointing of a healthy person is not a sacrament, nor has the force of a sacrament, but is merely a blessing, even when it is done with the same oil used to anoint, anoint the sick. Now, often you hear in modern times, including from bishops, Anyone can come forward, right? 
because you may be sick emotionally, mentally, spiritually, not only physically. But here they're limiting it to, nope, only if somebody is basically uh, at the point of death are they going to, we're going to consider this to be a sacrament of the mystery. They're trying to make a distinction. And they're making the distinction that those who are healthy are only receiving it as a blessing in a penitential type way, which brings back, remember what the catechism said that even the people that are sick, sometimes they also can get forgiveness of sins through it. So our current understanding is more in line with the ancient understanding of the uh, right of the lamp, that it can be utilized for multiple purposes. In the same way, we strictly prohibit that pastors or any other priests, so pastors here mean those who are in charge of a church, whereas priests could be monks or whatever. We strictly prohibit that pastors or any other priests in the celebration of blessing of the lamp, so celebrating the rite of the lamp, which is done for the healthy as a penance, to use the same rituals and prayers. They're prohibiting using the same ritual and prayers, which are used in the blessing of the holy oil of the sick, or say the same words anointing the healthy, which one said in the anointing of the sick. So now they're saying, you can't use these same prayers for those who are sick as those who are be being anointed in a penitential way. You have to use different types of prayers which is not how the rite of the lamp was structured, and neither was the its predecessor, the eucaleon, from the Greek tradition. It's utilized for, for sort of a both-and uh, way of, 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 of things. Next slide, please. So, to add to this confusion, uh, in, in 1897, there was a ritual book that was uh, produced by uh, the Archbishop of Beirut, Yusuf Dibs. It was called The Administration of the Divine Mysteries. And it, of course, had baptism in there and marriage, etc. But it also has the rite of the lamp in there. But it goes out of its way to distinguish it of how it differs from the anointing of the sick in five ways that it gives. And they and these all betray a Latin understanding of the mystery. And if you have an old copy of the um the 2001 uh let's see here the 2001 Passion Week book Bishop Dwayhe, God rest his soul, translated from part of that introduction of that book, and he lists the five ways in there. And if, if we have um, time during the question and answer, if anybody's interested, I can read them, them off. Uh, but suffice it to say, it, they really are um, not reflecting our tradition. And in fact, uh, next slide, please. Um, in my uh, my licentiate thesis in liturgical studies from the Pontifical Orient Institute in Rome that Sister mentioned, the oil of gladness, where I went through the historical origins of the rite of the lamp for the Maronites, I go through those five differences and show that they're not, it's not historically accurate and does not reflect our Eastern point of view. So I go through to kind of counteract, they're, they're saying this, but this is what, what's the history. They say this, this is what the history is. But beyond those five differences, you might still then have the question, because I'm sure uh, many of you probably have attended on Wednesday of Holy Week, the rite of the lamp. And we always give out the oil with some of the dough, um, it's an old practice. So you can say, well, how can you do, if, if this is the anointing of the sick, how can you give them the oil and, and the, the dough? But remember, that, that's the old ancient practice that we heard about, that they would give this. And the whole idea of the dough is that you would bake it and you're going to eat it. And so you're going to get a blessing internally. 
And that would have been probably what was done when somebody was sick um, at their home. The priest would gather, there would be the dough with the oil on there, and they would do the right of the lamp. And if the person was still able to eat, the family could bake the uh, the the dough into some bread for him to eat, him or her to eat, in addition to having been anointed with the oil um, by the priests. So um, it does still reflect the ancient practice. Next slide, please. Okay, so in our current practice, um, we, we use some of the prayers from the right of the lamp when we go to hospitals or nursing homes, et cetera, or in the church, when we bless people, there's a series of prayers. But the oil that we use is the oil that was blessed by the bishop on Holy Thursday or, well, in our eparchy, usually the Tuesday before Holy Week or before Passion Week. Um, but we use that oil instead of the, the priest blessing the oil. So we use the pre-blessed oil but we do some of the prayers. And so I'm gonna, we're gonna have three prayers here that uh, there's more than this in the ritual uh, that we use, but I, I just picked these uh, three. So in one of them we have, the priest puts his right hand on the head of the infirm. And he says, oh, Holy Father, in your mercy, I place my hand on your servant, so-and-so, relying on your abundant mercy. I ask you to rest your hand upon him or her the same hand that your son Jesus Christ placed upon lepers, and they were cleansed, upon the blind, and they were healed. So notice, while the priest is literally putting his hand on the person, he's asking God through him, through him to extend God's right hand through the priest, right? And then it, we're evoking what Christ did in the scriptures, putting his hand on the lepers, upon the blind. I ask you, O Lord, to place your hand on this, your servant, and free him or her from all sickness. Bless him or her and quick, quickly bring him, him or her back to good health, that he or she may glorify your name and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Notice all about restoration of health. Not, this is your last anointing. <laughs> Next, please. Now, as the priest actually anoints the person, okay, there's this prayer that is done, and we find this prayer in all the Eastern uh, rituals of like rite of the lamp types, so like the eucaleon from the Greeks, the rite of the lamp, whatever the different traditions call it, we will find this same prayer. It's not always the prayer of anointing, but it's always found somewhere in the text. Now, I'm going to read the prayer first, and then I'm going to go through the rubric. That's the red writing. That's the directions, because I want to point something out about that. O Holy Father, divine physician of souls and bodies, you sent your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to heal all sickness and to deliver us from death. We ask you through the grace of Jesus Christ, your son, the anointed one, to heal your servant from every sickness of soul and body through this holy anointing. And we give glory and thanks to you, to your only son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Again, evoking healing, not only though now of the body, but we're also asking for healing of the soul. Okay, and that could be through forgiveness of sins, but it can also be whatever the, the soul needs, right? But notice we, we invoke the, the Holy Father, not the Pope Holy Father, but our Heavenly Father, as the divine physician. Okay, so there, the person may be in a hospital with all kinds of physicians, but there's the divine physician, God. Now, notice how it takes place. In the middle of the prayer, the priest, it says, anoints the sick person with the oil of the sick in the form of the cross, from the forehead, over the nose, down to the chin, and from the right ear, across the eyes, to the left ear. Now, this 
form of the anointing is only found in one manuscript of the rite of the lamp, and it's a it's a very Latinized manuscript. But when in 1942, when they were revising the rite of the lamp to, for publication. They had to take in consideration some of the requirements from the Synod of Mount Lebanon, which insisted that just like in the Latin tradition, all the, the five senses had to be anointed. They decided, well, since we have this one in this unique kind of form of, of anointing, that this would be the way that we would um, do the anointing. But it does not reflect the ancient practice, which usually just says, between the eyes on the forehead. Next slide, please. And then in, in the 1942 ritual book, the, the prayers for anointing concludes with this prayer. O Lord, through your angel of mercy, extend the right hand of your mercy upon your servant. Free him or her from all sickness and from the forces of evil just as you healed the mother-in-law of Simon Peter from fever and cured the hemorrhaging woman, as you had mercy on the widow who lost her son, as you called Lazarus from the tomb, and as you healed the centurion servant by your word, as you extinguished the flames to spare the children of Ananias and closed the mouths of the lions in their den where your servant Daniel had been thrown. Now, O Lord God, compassionate, merciful, patient, and rich in grace and truth. Extend your right hand full of mercy and help your servant. We ask this through the prayers of all those who have pleased you from the beginning to the present day. We raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. I always love this prayer. It's a very beautiful prayer. But it also has two core parts, which are divided up here. The first section of the prayer is known as the anamnetic section from the Greek word anamnesis, meaning remembrance, right? Like, like in the liturgy, we remember your death. That's the anamnesis. So we're, we recall here, as you did for the mother-in-law, Simon, Simon Peter, as you did for the hemorrhaging woman, as you did for the widow, as you did for Lazarus, as you did for the centurion servant, as you did for Ananias, right? As you did for Daniel in the lion's den. You did all these things in the past, Lord. To, to help your people, then it then the the second section is known as the epicletic section. So the the invoking, okay, just like in the liturgy when the priest evokes the Holy Spirit, animorio. Here, now, O Lord God, extend your right hand full of mercy and help your servant. We ask this. So the community, on behalf of the sick person, is is asking for this. And with that. I think we're at question and answer. And there's some suggested readings. Every, I think we passed those out. And, oops. Okay. Thank you, Father. Wow, that was a lot of good stuff to take in. We appreciate the preparation, the slides, mm -hmm. the readings. I'm sure that will give us a lot to kind of um, just reflect on. Uh, so we're going to open it up now for any questions that you might have, any comments. We encourage you to share in the uh, chat. Or if you would like to ask Father directly the question, um, just raise your hand and then we can... Um, Unmute you and, and you, you can go ahead and ask your question. Father, you had mentioned maybe just to give people some time if they have any questions. You had mentioned uh, the prayer of forgiveness and also um, on Holy Saturday, the Saturday of the Light, uh, the, the the penance that or the the service that we have the Saturday of forgiveness. And I was just thinking, I wish more of our Maronite people knew about it or held it in more of a regard because I find that the prayers of that service are quite beautiful and, and very moving. I'm not sure if um, some of you have actually attended on this. Um, yeah. 
this discussion, but it's just been a, a gift to be able to look forward to that service um, and yeah, appreciate the gift of God's mercy. Even after he's put on the cross, um, there's, an, there's another invitation, <laughs> come, come repent, come receive the mercy of God and be reconciled. Yeah. Yes, and it's a, you know, it's a silent day. Um, it's the one day that the Corbono really should not be celebrated on. And um, it, it is unlike the um, the other days of, of, of the uh, fasting season, Saturdays usually are kind of lighter. But that's it is a fasting day still, which gets confused because, first of all, we celebrate it at noon, which is not the traditional time when it would have been celebrated. And I'm not sure where this came about, but we start doing the uh, this um, Christ is risen uh, at the end of it and in the manuscripts. And in the uh, even in the, the the ritual, one of the ritual books from the eighteen um, eighteen thirty nine, which is where we basically take a lot of these things from now, does not have it. So I, I don't know where that kind of came about that we started doing that because it makes no sense to be proclaiming Christ is risen and, until we midnight. For the for the resurrection, so um, but it is a beautiful service. Um, it was it was traditionally celebrated at three in the afternoon, but you're not free to then start, you know, feasting yet. But it but it was a, a way to uh, to really, uh, uh, you know, I think it was a way to try and fulfill the idea of penance before. The resurrection, you know, could be for, sort sort of what they now would call like the Easter duty or whatever. But we wouldn't have had that idea specifically. But um, but yeah, I encourage people to take advantage of it. Hopefully, your priests are actually celebrating it. That's a whole other question. Yes. So we have some really good comments and questions in the chat. The first is from Crawford. Uh, he says, one, I understand the Maronite church did not develop its own right of individual confession and that in ancient times, people would be reconciled through the order of penitence. What is known about where penitents were reconciled in the Maronite church before adopting the confessional? Were they, were they reconciled near the sanctuary as the Byzantines do? And then there's a second part to that. Is there any tradition in the literature of a connection between the dough from the oil of the lamp and the Eucharist, especially since the Corbono text regularly says the Eucharist is for the forgiveness of sins? Um, okay, let me, try, let, me, let me try and go through these one. I understand that Mary should deny Uh, well, we really don't know what the, um, the ancient practice was. I mean, it's, it's pretty vague, unfortunately. We just don't have a lot of the documents. Um, and even things we have, like probably the earliest document we would have is like the Katabal Huda. And it'll talk about fasting and it talks about penance, but it doesn't set out like here's the ritual for doing that um so unfortunately we really don't know and it um as far as confessing publicly i would say by the time of any documents we have already some kind of form of private confession was taking place probably based upon the monastic tradition from the desert fathers um but uh i mean it's basically speculate it'd be anything i would say on that would be speculation because there's just not a not enough documentation unfortunately mm -hmm. um as far as the dough for the oil of the lamp um there is a thought that maybe the oil the dough on, on wednesday was used for holy thursday for the eucharist but it wouldn't have been used it 
you wouldn't be doing the oil, the dough for the oil, the lamp on a regular basis. Um, you baked bread, especially for the Eucharist. The, the Eucharist is forgiving because it's Jesus Christ. He can certainly forgive sins more than, than I can do. Uh, I can make signs of the cross all day long, but um, it's only through the power of Jesus Christ that I'm able to, to forgive somebody anyways. Um, and so the Eucharist is forgiving in itself, but it's a double-edged sword. Let's not forget, right? Um, because uh, as St. Paul tells us in First Corinthians, you know, some of you are sick because you're receiving in an unworthy manner. So we have to be worthy to, re to receive it. But the forgiveness of sins are talking about in the, in the Eucharist is not things like you murdered somebody, oh, I can just go to confession. Obviously, St. Basil dealt with that stuff, right? That you're excommunicated for that. But for minor sins, um, because there really wasn't a a form for going for minor sins. There was like, you would fast, you would do other acts of penance and then be able to go to the communion and then the communion itself would also be forgiving. And think about it during the liturgy, when we burn incense, the charcoal represents God's mercy. Um, and the, the incense represents our sins being placed upon God's mercy, which are transformed from, from nasty, evil things into sweet smelling prayers that rise to God. So that's why we incense the people. It's a purifying thing. Um, you also have how many times the priest is extending his hand, impositions of hands during the liturgy. The right we, Before we get to communion, we have the Our Father. That's a penitential section of the liturgy, which then, what are you proclaimed? Holy for the holy, right? The holy, meaning the Eucharist, for the holy. Who are the holy? Hopefully, we are, right? So it's 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 a proclamation that you're 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 holy, but yet then right after we go, make us worthy, because <laughs> we have to still recognize that we're never really worthy to uh, to receive the Lord. It's only through His grace that we're able to. Amen, Father Claude. The next question is from Flavia. How did they used to do public confession? Well, the it, in those days, it was basically stuff that was already known. Like, let's face it, anybody that's been to Lebanon knows if you've been in a small village, everybody's related, typically. Or if you're not, everybody probably knows everybody's business. So if you were cheating on your wife, I'm pretty sure at some point they're, it's going to be found out. So it was publicly known anyways. If you if you murdered somebody, now, maybe you got away with it, but then you felt sorry for it. And so you would just, you would come clean. But everybody would know these were public sins. If you were an apostate, you denied Jesus Christ. So, you know, it'd be a public, um, it'd be a public sin. So um, because it was public, it, it destroyed the community, the, the community has to help readmit you. You have to be re readmitted to the community. Um, so mm -hmm. that that kind of a thing. So it it wouldn't nece necessarily be always verbal. It could have been, but um, you know. So Father, we have some more questions. I'm going to just read through some of them. So this is from Terry. She said, "How should we utilize the oil that we take back home with us from the rite of the lamp? We keep it in a prominent." We keep it in a prominent place in our home and our children grab it when they feel bad? Well, I wouldn't suggest that per se. I mean, really, I think what you should do is you take it home, bake it, and, you know, if, if it's only a small amount, give everybody a piece of the, of the blessed bread, you know. If you can't bake it that night, maybe, you know, wait till the next day, but it should be consumed. It should be uh, I mean, it's eventually going to go bad. <laughs> I mean, so. Um, yeah. And Subdeacon, thank you, Father. Subdeacon Norbert, he wrote, I've heard that the local parishes would have to give an offering to the bishop in exchange for the oil. If so, that might be a practical reason for being so strict that oil blessed by the bishop be used. Um, I don't know. Never heard that. So, um, uh, 
you can point me into where where you're taking that from, I would be uh, interested, but I really don't know about that. Because usually it was typically the people would bring the oil and they basically got it back. I mean, that's that was my understanding, but uh, uh, could be wrong. Flavia had another question. Did they do a confession aloud in front of everyone? Well, again, it probably it would only been if, if it wasn't already known what they had done, but it wouldn't be like, oh, I, uh, you know, I got mad while I was driving, you know, or it, that it wasn't those kind of, that was not confession those days. Public confession was you murdered somebody, you committed adultery, the, the big ones, you know, uh, so it, it wasn't minor little infractions here. So um, it was either people, it was already known, or again, you were coming clean, uh, for, for which you would be then publicly stating what, what, what you did. Mm -hmm. Rada, her question is, how can a dying person's sins be forgiven if he cannot ask for forgiveness and maybe he is not aware of what is happening around him? Okay, so the current practice now, again, we borrowed this from, from the Latin tradition, is um, the plenary indulgence, which is give a special apostolic blessing that's given from the, the Pope that priests can do in the case of somebody. Um, I mean, obviously, we don't know what the person's intention is. You, you certainly have to have Yes, the intention. But say if somebody was sorry for what they, they did, you know, but they didn't get a chance to go to confession. Um, let's give a simple example. Like say if somebody was on their way to, to the church to go to confession and they got in a car accident and, and, you know, the priest has to rush to the hospital to anoint them and he can give this plenary indulgence. Well, in that case, the person had the intention, but that's, that's the case always. I mean, if the person, if, if people come to con confession, but they don't have sorrow, they're not truly sorry for what they did, then it doesn't matter how many times I make the sign of the cross over them or read prayers of absolution, they will not be forgiven. You have to have the contrition, the contrition has to be there first and foremost. That's the core element. Um, so, um, I mean, we all ultimately leave it up to to God, and that's why we also pray for those who are who have departed from us that they didn't have the chance to repent. You know, maybe um, that God be merciful to them. Ron, you asked, Father, can venial sins be forgiven if confessed directly to our God instead of going to the priest? Well, yes, God can forgive our sins. I mean, but, um, I mean, for me, penance also has to do with, there's a psychological di dimension. You know, I don't know about you, but if, if I go, when I go to confession, I feel so much more refreshed from, from that experience that when I depart, I feel much better than if I just go and stand before the, uh, the tabernacle and say, Lord, forgive me for this. You know, I, I got angry today at so-and-so. And, -so and I, I'm i sure God's forgiving me, but I don't know. Sometimes I don't feel it, whereas I feel it if I go to, to confession by hearing, doing a penance, hearing that uh, the priests say, you know, go in peace. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, God can do whatever he wants, <laughs> but... Uh, I think that it's it's important that we utilize this great mystery that the church has given us. Yes. Father, in um, a confidential question, how often should one go to confession? Is once a month or every six weeks considered too often, they're asking? 
Sorry, can you repeat the question? How often should one go to confession? Is once a month or every six weeks considered too often, or is that relatively a good, uh, you know? I think that's a. I think that's a good um, time. You know, as as confessors, we always have to be uh, listening to. If somebody comes like every week, and you know, we have to be concerned that they might be scrupulous. Mm -hmm. and scrupulosity itself is is uh, is a sin, where basically you think God can never really forgive me. I'm the worst person because it, it it means you don't trust in God. You don't believe that God can can forgive. Um, now the converse of that is people that you know, I go every thirty years whether I need it or not. Mm -hmm. You know. But the church teaches that we should um, go at least once a year, right? And also you receive the Eucharist at least once a year. Yes. I, I think that's kind of on the other extreme of, of things. So once a month, I think, is, is decent. But obviously, if something happens major in between, get to confession as soon as possible. But I think in a, in a month, prob, month, four weeks to six weeks, we probably all have done a number of things that we can can go to confession for. You know? Yes, for sure. And just the last question, Father, thank you for answering that so so nicely. Um, if a priest is not available, can we, as baptized, anoint the sick who are dying? Not now. <laughs> It's it's only priests and and bishops that can uh, anoint the sick. I was going through the historical thing of what you know. At one point, it was more important about who blessed the oil less than who did the anointing. But that is not no absolutely it, that it, that it would not be considered. I think valid. <laughs> uh, you can confer with some canon lawyers on that, but I'm pretty sure that that would be the answer. That it's not. Uh, it wouldn't be valid. So, I mean, you can see that the there's been a lot of development over the years in uh, these two mysteries, probably more than some of the others, just because the other ones were uh, more ritualized earlier on versus these kind of had a later uh, development. So we just have a nice uh, closing comment before we wrap up with a prayer. Ch Sherry wrote, I'm so grateful for these wonderful mysteries. Thank you for your insight. This was excellent information. And I would second that, Father Claude. You did a great job tonight. Thank you for all the preparations. And um, it's a blessing for sure to have this. Thank you. Thank you, sisters. Thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in and listening to me ramble on. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it was clear and, uh, and understandable. Uh, I know it's a lot to take in, but uh, you can always go back and look at the slides. <laughs> and uh, and then if you feel so inclined to look at all, read all those materials that I uh, added. Uh, but l let me just uh, point out that uh, an excellent book um, is this one by Scott Hahn called Lord Have Mercy, The Healing Power of Confession. Mm -hmm. uh, he does he he covers some history, but he does it in a way that's not doesn't feel like a history book. And uh, and anybody that knows Scott Hahn, he's it's very uh, it's very spiritual and biblical. So it's an excellent book. So I, I, I highly recommend that you uh, pick that up. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. And just before you do closing prayer, uh, one announcement is next Thursday, we have Father Gary George speaking on the Eucharist. So um, looking forward towards that presentation for sure as well. Yes. Father, did you want the slide for this? Yes. Yeah, so people can follow along. Um, they can maybe, they can sing at home. Yes. <laughs> if they like. Our concluding prayer is actually a hymn. It's um, it's the uh, the supplication from the 
the uh, forgiveness service on um, on Saturday of the light. So this would be like after the readings. Okay. First, I'll do the let's do a glory be, and then I'll so glory the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. O oh, hearts full of anger, take heed. Go make peace with your foes and embrace them with love and compassion. Engrave on your souls Jesus Christ as he humbled himself. You should humble yourselves and grant pardon. Does anger still reign in your hearts? Then you turn from the Lord, Christ who died on the cross, your true teacher. If love for your neighbor is gone, then you hate Jesus Christ, who taught mercy and love and forgiveness. Let Christ be our teacher and guide, for he showed us the way to forgive from our hearts, imitate him. All foes will be turned into friends, and together in peace we'll sing praises to him who forgave us. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful, Father Claude. Thank you. Yes. Everyone, we wish you a good night and thank you for your great questions and God willing, we'll see you next week. Yes. Awesome. Thank, thank you, you, Father. Thank you, Sonakaya. <laughs>